Thank you so much for joining this first session of our Sustainable Urban Mobility and Transport Cluster. I am Susana Arellano, Urban Development Expert for IORC North America, and I'm connecting today from New York in the US. We would like to know where you're connecting from, so please add it in the chat. For the past two years, most of us have been using Zoom, but just as a reminder, all presenters, please make sure to mute your microphone if you're not speaking, but we do want to see you, so feel free to turn on your camera. For the audience, if you have any questions, please add it in the Q&A box by clicking the bubbles icon at the bottom of your screen. And for the panelists, uh, feel free to answer the questions anytime, even if that question is not directed to you, since we know that most of us are facing uh, very similar challenges and also identifying uh, solutions. Also, as a reminder, this session is being recorded and we will share the link at a later date with all attendees. I'm delighted to see so many cities join today. I have been in contact with many of you here. And um, this is such an important session because public transport has become one of the most important topics in our cities and metropolitan areas, since we're all working towards a goal of zero emissions by 2030. This session will be divided into two parts. The first with a presentation about technology, integrating systems and reevaluating strategies. And the second part will be more of a space for city officials and other stakeholders to discuss challenges and solutions related to sustainable public transport and mobility. As you may know, Zaragoza was a leader for, is the leader for our sustainable mobility and transport cluster in IORC North America. And they successfully participated in the previous phase of IORC paired with Chihuahua, Mexico, and have demonstrated not only a commitment to become a global reference for sustainable transport and mobility in Zaragoza, but also to share all of these expertise with other cities. So now I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Miguel Angel Anya, who is our Senior Advisor to the Department of Public Services and Mobility of Zaragoza, Spain. Miguel Angel. Thank you very much for your words, uh, Susana, and uh, welcome everybody. Good morning and good afternoon, because I think we have uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, I will try to introduce what uh, are we uh, uh, doing now in uh, Zaragoza. Zaragoza is, uh, is the fifth uh, city in Spain with 700,000 inhabitants. We are just in the middle way from Madrid to Barcelona, just to uh, uh, orient everybody where Zaragoza is. I will share the screen with my presentation. So uh, we are going to uh, speak today about one of the major problems, uh, uh, projects we have uh, now running on the city. Uh, we are committed to obtain the zero emissions uh, target for the, for the city in 2030. One of the, of the most important areas of work is uh, mobility. And within mobility, we have been working uh, in this direction since uh, 2004, and at that time, the mayor of Zaragoza asked a group of experts to advise about what will be the future of the uh, public transport in the city. Uh, these uh, experts belong to the uh, Association of Industrial Engineers, and I was leading this group at that time. And uh, we were discussing a lot um, about if we need to, to introduce one um, underground, if we need to introduce a tramway, or we need to uh, uh, evolve with the buses that we had in the town, in the town at, that, uh, at that time. The final uh, assessment we uh, uh, we advised the major was that the future should be linked to buses, big buses of 
up to uh, 24 meters driven by hydrogen. And uh, these buses, the uh, hydrogen buses were by were bought to be uh, were running during the expo uh, that was uh, held in uh, Zaragoza in in uh, 2008. We have this model. We are very lucky because we we have almost the half of the of the movements in our town are uh, non motorized uh, movements. Miguel, we I have uh, four. One thing, yeah? um, it's cutting off a little bit. Maybe um, would it be possible for us to share the presentation and then you're just speaking? Maybe I think that will help with the bandwidth. Yeah. Perfect, okay. Okay. Well, the the forty percent, forty six percent are pedestrian movements. The three percent are uh, bikes or scooters, and the forty, the twenty four percent of uh, public uh, uh, are uh, made in public transport. So uh, our intention is to increase the pedestrian and uh, and bicycle uh, movements to reduce the private vehicle use and to increase the public transport users as complement of a pedestrian dis displacement. Uh, according to this, we don't have any pollution problem in our town. We never have reached the levels of uh, uh, of uh, the legal commitment in Europe. So we don't have a necessity to uh, make uh, drastic decisions in order to reduce the uh, pollution in the town. Nevertheless, we are working very hard to increase the expectations for public uh, transport. Uh, if we are going to reduce the same percent of, uh, of uh, the um, polluters, of the emissions, we need to transform the vehicles that pollute the most. And these are the public transport, these are the last man distribution, and uh, these are the vehicles that collect uh, waste and, and so on. So this was the, the prime goal. We had the one opportunity, unique opportunity. During the pandemic, no private vehicles were running on the streets. So the only vehicles that were allowed to uh, run on the streets were precisely the most pollutant. And we uh, detected that the, the emissions were reduced only by 50%. So even uh, uh, closing the traffic in, in the city, we, we, are, uh, we were not able to reduce totally the emissions because most of the emissions were created by this type of vehicles. Huh? And this is precisely why this decision we are uh, taking of uh, making our transport non polluter is critical. Zaragoza, I may introduce this, Zaragoza is a city of trams. Uh, we have uh, the first line of electric trams started in 1902. And for almost 120 years, our trams were manufactured in a, in a factory that we have and now is called, uh, the company is called CAF. We were the last town to operate trams in the last century. Finally, the major decided to use one tram as a, the transport of the, of the 21st century. And this tram uh, started to operate in 2030, 13, and 
uh, we have a lot of uh, different advantages. The traffic road, road was uh, reduced by 15% uh, in, in the total uh, uh, part of the, uh, the whole uh, city. And in the center of the town, the traffic was reduced by uh, 40%. So uh, we reach to, to get that almost a, a quarter of the public transport users are now using the tram. That means 25 million people in, uh, two, uh, in 2019. As uh, CAF, uh, as a local factory, was uh, producing and designing this tram, we have uh, had more than 200 cities from uh, more than 60 different countries that has been visiting our tram. And our tram has the top level of, uh, of uh, characteristics of this uh, type of, uh, of vehicles uh, that should be uh, done uh, at this moment. The user rating is also very positive. Huh? The qualification, the rating is 8.5 over 10 points. However, this tram poses us two very serious problems that were advised at the very beginning with the uh, uh, consultation to the experts. The solution is very expensive and economically is quite difficult to sustain, has uh, losses of uh, 5 million euros per year. And this is uh, quite uh, serious for, uh, for the exploitation of the line. Also, the substitution of bus lines at that moment uh, uh, produced uh, one uh, a scar in the public transport because it should be uh, done at that, uh, at that time and overall redistribution of the network of the public transport instead of only uh, build uh, only one line without uh, restructuring the rest of the public, uh, the public transport network. So, uh, this is relating with, with trams, but what happens with buses? As the solution, we think that we're uh, uh, sustained by buses and hydrogen buses were not so much developed at that time, we started to work with electrical buses. We uh, bought four electrical buses in, uh, in 20, uh, uh, 19, but we have testing a lot of different mo models. A lot of different models, all of them in the same condition, in the same line. We have been testing uh, with uh, different configurations of uh, batteries, of uh, plugging, uh, of uh, operation, up to uh, 15 different models. And also we have been trying recently, very recently, one fuel cell, cell hydrogen bus that runs very well at, the, at this moment. And so uh, the, the uh, municipality took the decision that uh, uh, determined that every new public transport buses will be only zero emissions admitted. So it should be electric, or hydrogen drive. Well, um, if we arrived at uh, the point, when we arrived at the point that uh, the, um, uh, the complete fleet was uh, zero emissions, we will uh, sparing, we will saving most than Six hundred twenty-one thousand tons of uh, CO2 uh, uh, emissions. That is a considerable amount of saving. 
But the surprise we had is when we uh, were studying the economical balance of uh, this implementation with the four buses running during two years, after two years, we could, we could uh, see that we also have a saving in economy. Finally, if, when you consider the uh, amortization, the operation cost of the buses during the whole life, and we compare them with uh, the actual fleet of uh, hybrid uh, buses, the electrical ones were less expensive than hybrid. So uh, finally, it's not only one ecological decision, it's also an economical one. And what have been uh, doing recently? We have, uh, uh, we started working with these electrical buses, making uh, uh, some uh, requirements and the electrical buses as the actual state of the art in, uh, in this uh, technology could fulfill the 70% of the services that we have at this moment. That is uh, quite a lot because we, uh, we have 10 years to uh, change completely the fleet at the range of approximately uh, three, uh, 35 buses per year. So this, uh, at the end of this year, we will have uh, 72 new buses, new electrical buses uh, that will be, uh, meaning one in every five buses will be uh, electrical. And uh, we will need for the uh, installation of the chargings uh, uh, sets for uh, for the buses, we will need 20 mega uh, watts of power. That is uh, a lot. It's the conception, the average conception of a city of uh, uh, 16,000 people, hmm? only for the fleet of trucks. So uh, they are working now with hydrogen uh, technologies that should be uh, uh, necessary to complete the 30% of the services that cannot be attended today by uh, this type of, of, of uh, buses. But uh, the, the buses are not only the, the, the project, the key point of the project is also the uh, one renovation of the of the network. So uh, we have been uh, doing this uh, regarding uh, certain concepts. Uh, we are making the designing this uh, using different types of uh, of lines that should be uh, running, and that's a, as a combination of circular lines, diametrical lines tangential lines, radial lines, or feeding lines, short feeding lines, uh, to uh, 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 approach people from the outskirts of the town to the main uh, uh, lines. And with this configuration, with a maximum of uh, two transfer, you can reach any destination from any, from, from any point in the city. Most of the cases, that means about 90% of the cases with this configuration, with only one transfer, you can go from uh, any point to another point. We have uh, been uh, following two major examples of this. Uh, one is the, the new bus network that is uh, now running in Barcelona. Barcelona has a, 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 one special design of the town. It's completely orthogonal, uh, so they are uh, still vertical uh, streets, and they have been uh, creating these lines following these connections. So any line is interfering, has an intersection with another 
other other line, even vertical or horizontal. So with only one transfer, you can go from any point to other point. It's like a plane. Uh, uh, um, uh, chess uh, uh, game and also the underground of Moscow has this configuration in this configuration the, 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 the most important thing is there is a circular line that is interfering with the other lines so with only with two connections two transfers you can go from anywhere to another another place surely but most of the cases only with one uh, transfer you can uh, move steadily and easily within the city so the proposal we are now designing has four circular lines seven diameter lines and a significant number of feeding lines so they are not represented here but uh, the shape is, is quite simple what are the objectives we are uh, uh, willing to obtain with this uh, change of the network? We will increase our commercial speed by 20%. That means that the travel time times will be reduced by 20%. We will uh, maintain intervals of five minutes throughout the whole ne network. So that means uh, uh, there are not uh, the times of waiting times on the stops. We, we have already a bus stop at less than 300 meters for almost the uh, totality of, uh, of the population. That means uh, uh, we have a very, very good service. And uh, we hope that we will increase the number of uses of public transport by 20%. That is a key point. And this will uh, uh, drive to a reduction of the use of private vehicles by a 30%, with a two transfer maximum. And this uh, configuration will integrate the tramway line into the network. Also, we are uh, working a lot uh, promoting the safety of the use of the public transport. We have been receiving some international recognition uh, uh, for uh, both the bus and, uh, and the tram lines. And uh, the, the public transport, transport should be combined with other actions that we are uh, now implementing in parallel in the town. The first one, we are now working with a new traffic control center that integrates the whole system in the city in a, with a, a smart and uh, AI technology. Uh, we are uh, now uh, uh, start running with a new uh, mobility as a service application that integrates uh, public transport, integrates uh, uh, taxis, integrates uh, shared mobility, integrates integrate parking, Everything related with uh, mobility is integrated on the mobility as a service uh, platform. And also uh, we, we can uh, uh, plan uh, a travel depending on what we want to uh, have, uh, more speed, uh, cheaper, uh, more safety or less pollutant. And also, we can pay any of the services directly from the phone. And uh, another, another development is uh, we have uh, integrated a new application for the visually impaired people that could reach, uh, that can reach the, the buses, the, the public uh, transport with a mobile phone that reads directly uh, those uh, 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 system, that is uh, the scouts that are uh, named Navilens, and with uh, some ears, earphones, 
uh, they uh, are guiding the, the impaired to the bus stop and within uh, inside also inside the, the vehicles. So they are uh, following the instructions they receive, they can move very easily to the uh, public transport and within the uh, vehicles. Also, we have uh, another, another action. Uh, we are now uh, making a network of uh, charging points for electrical vehicles with more than 200 points uh, distributed in uh, 36 areas within the town and also improving a lot the network of infrastructure for a uh, bike uh, for a bicycle so at this moment the 100% the totality of the streets of the town have other lines with a speed limited to 30 kilometers per hour or bike lines this has been allowed an increase of the traffic by bike of an 80 percent so uh, we are on the way but also we are uh, working for the mobility of the future we could not uh, stop here uh, as one of the major uh, pollutants on the city is the last mile distribution we are working on, uh, on the distribution project with uh, autonomous vehicles for last mile and also for uh, last mile distribution with drones. Uh, we have uh, been designing a uh, uh, number of uh, airways within the, the town with a, uh, a network of uh, vertiports that should be able to uh, allow the distribution of goods by air within the town. This is a, a complete uh, new uh, and advanced uh, mobility. Uh, and we have been reserving a big area inside the town to make the trials and demonstrations of this type of technology. This uh, surface is uh, 17 uh, hectares of uh, terrain that is uh, the biggest in Europe dedicated to this. And very recently we have been in touch uh, with a uh, group of, uh, of technicians that are preparing the European Hyperloop Network. And we, were, we are considered as the hub of uh, the, the Iberian Peninsula for Hyperloop in uh, the new network that should be uh, uh, in uh, should be running in 20 years. And finally, we uh, we we should be not able to uh, reduce to zero the we are going to emit anyway. And we are working to compensate these emissions to reach the goal of become a zero emissions uh, city. And so we are uh, now uh, creating a forest, the forest that we call the forest of the citizens, uh, in which uh, we are planting one tree per any uh, citizen in Zaragoza, that means 700,000 uh, trees with uh, a corresponding number of shrubs. And we are using 1,200 hectares using the recycled organic waste to improve the richness of the soil. So uh, this is a circular uh, uh, economy project. And uh, finally, uh, we think that we could reach the objective in 10 years. So uh, uh, we have a very tough uh, uh, task to do, but we are working very hard for it. And that's all. Thank you so much, Miguel Angel.
It has been a very complete presentation. I really like how you're not talking only about the successes, but also about the challenges. For example, we keep hearing about how many of the cities that are here today are trying to implement a tram in their cities. And now we're learning from you that in Zaragoza is becoming actually a challenge. It's becoming a scar in the city. It's becoming um, not sustainable in terms of economy. So I would like to open now the floor to any questions. So feel free to add it in the Q&A box or also raise your hand and we can just hear them live. Miguel Angel, I'll, I'll jump in here um, while people are, are thinking. And I, um, like Susana said, it was a thank you so much for that presentation. It was really inspiring and, and comprehensive. And um, one question that I'm sure a lot of people in our audience uh, are wondering is, you have, I mean, all of the initiatives that you have are probably the envy of a lot of of a lot of cities and you know, we'd like to hear more about the, the financing mechanisms, um, which probably is a, it's a webinar in itself, but if you could share with us um, how, how you've managed, how the city has managed to, to finance uh, these different initiatives, uh, I think there would be a lot of interest in understanding that and knowing a bit about that. Yeah, <laughs> well, the uh, changing of the bus uh, fleet it's uh, made uh, with the collaboration of the company that is uh, uh, the, it's, uh, running the transport in the, in the municipality. And also we are going to receive uh, uh, funds from the European uh, uh, Commission uh, regarding this. But economically, it's a, a sustainable loan uh, we are now uh, uh, able to uh, pay the tr uh, transformation of the buses without any increase of our budget. Mm -hmm. So with the, with the payment of the tickets, we can pay for it. Uh, it uh, is not the same, the same position with the tram. The tram is much more, is four times more, more expensive and, uh, and it uh, needs a lot of, uh, of uh, resources, economical resources from the part of the budget. And the rest, and, and the rest are made by concessions to public uh, companies. So uh, uh, really we are not paying for it. It's self, self sustainable. Uh, economy. Thank you, Miguel Angel. That's really surprising and unbelievable for many cities that are here today. Um, well, at least from the experience that we have heard um, with our IURC cohort, we have a question actually from um, Merida. In the case of Zaragoza, are you part of the municipal or the regional government? No, we are part only for the municipal. Uh, government. Okay. The regional government has nothing to do with uh, this. We have another question for you, Miguel Angel. Um, what has been the impact in terms of travel times saving for new tram users when compared to buses or other mo modes? Well, the tram, the tram is uh, uh, faster uh, than uh, uh, is, is faster than a bus because he uh, runs it runs on a dedicated uh, line. So the commercial speed for for the tram is around uh, twenty kilometers per hour, and uh, the bus is around fifteen kilometers per hour. Uh, the question is uh, the, the reservation of the line, and also it benefits of a, a, a traffic lights priority. So means that uh, uh, um, the the tram only stops at the at the tram stops, uh, never stops at the traffic light because it opens the way uh, wherever it is uh, is approaching. Uh, the crossing. 
And this don't happen with this. Uh, this is not happening uh, with uh, the buses. Uh, the buses is a more complex network and they have not this priority, uh, but it can be uh, done. And this, uh, this priority uh, light uh, tram uh, uh, system has been designed within the, the, the team of the municipality. Thank you for that, Miguel Angel. And please stay for the second part, which we're gonna start now. And as many of the cities know, it's very important for us as IURC um, to really make these connections between cities. So we would like to have during the second part, city delegates and other uh, stakeholders participate in a conversation that can kickstart the exchange of knowledge and advance their sustainable mobility and transport plans. So we will now hear from different perspectives, perspectives in different cities. Each presenter will have between two minutes um, to present their challenge or solution. And I really know this is very little time, but this is just, again, um, to learn a little bit about what you're doing or what you're facing in your city. And we will, from there, Thank you, David, for sharing the screen. And we will, from there, um, facilitate those conversations. So if you identify any um, solution or challenge that you're interested in, feel free to ask us to make an introduction to those cities and those delegates. You can send us an email to anyone from the IURC North America team, and you will have our emails now in the chat. We are going to start with one question that we have heard over and over from many cities. And it is how do we make our transport and mobility more sustainable? And it sounds very broad, but we have heard from many about those small interventions that have been made um, to really transform mobility in their cities. So I invite Ariana Vito from Santa Monica to be the first one and talk about what you are doing in Santa Monica. Susanna, hi everyone. Um, so yeah, I'll just give a quick overview of a couple of things that we've been doing in Santa Monica. Um, uh, just for some background, I work for the city's Office of Sustainability and the Environment um, and focus on a lot of our transportation electrification work. Um, so I'll start off um, we actually have. Oh, Susanna, your, are you, you, you have, have the slides, right? Yes, <laughs> okay. We have your slides. Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, this is just a snapshot of um, what you can see is a very congested um, major corridor in our downtown area. Um, this is our, like, near our Santa Monica promenade area. And we um, have done a few different things to try and work on this particularly around increasing our active mobility options. Um, so we have, um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, one of our big initiatives to reduce emissions uh, from our transit sector has of course um, had to switch to electric buses as well. So we have a goal of having a 100% zero emission fleet by 2030. Um, and so we got our first electric buses a couple years ago um, and we were testing them out. They were a new, um, we used a company called Gillig, which manufactured our other buses, which had been natural gas and renewable natural gas for a while. Um, and so they were piloting, transitioning to electric. And so we decided to stick with the same manufacturer just because it was the same drivetrain and the same everything else. Um, so now we have 19 battery electric buses. We just received um, a big shipment of, of additional 17 um, over the past few months and have also been working on building out our charging infrastructure because of course um, it is a huge um, amount of energy that's needed to power all of these buses. So we'll be testing out um, or introducing these new buses into our fleet over these next few months, um, which is really exciting. They actually look quite similar to the other, um, our regular buses. So this is an image here. Um, but it, yeah, it really does look a lot similar, um, but I think they're going to be having the zero emission on the top, which is kind of cool. Um, and if you want to go to the next slide, I'll just um, talk about another big initiative, which has been adding protected bike lanes. So the city has 
a pretty robust bike network um, that we adopted a bike action plan back in 2011 and have installed over 100 miles of bike lanes um, since then. So over the past 10 or so years. Um, and just for context, we're a pretty small city. We're at eight square miles. So we, we have a lot of bike lanes, but they're just for the most part, regular um, painted lanes, not protected. So um, we did introduce this new protected bike lane on Ocean Avenue, which is a pretty big intersection. Um, you can kind of see it connects um, to a pathway which goes down to the beach. Um, so across where the traffic light is, there's a ramp that goes down and connects to the beach um, from this overlook area. And since implementing this protected bike lane, we've seen um, a 19% increased ridership on this Ocean Avenue corridor because um, it's also used to connect to downtown. So this has been something that is increasingly a priority of the city. Um, initially, when the bike plan came out, there wasn't really a standard um, formal design guideline for protected bike lanes. And there wasn't a whole lot of data showing the benefits um, of making the investment in these versus others, even though, of course, you would assume that they make people feel, feel a lot safer. So we also have plans to add another protected bike lane on our 17th Avenue corridor, um, which is a big connector to our local college and some other schools. Um, so we're working on, on adding more of these protected bike lanes because they really do um, give people that bigger sense of security that mm -hmm. they have um, more protection. And then if you wanna to go to the next slide, We've also been working on a zero emission delivery zone pilot. Um, and this is in partnership with a local organization called the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. And so the city Santa Monica applied to be the host city for this pilot program, which is part of a much broader um, slate of initiatives. So pilots and other projects working on reducing the whole LA, Los Angeles regions um, carbon emissions related to the transportation sector by the 2028 Olympics. And so this is one pilot um, with the idea of reducing emissions from the first mile, last mile of deliveries. So as we all know, commercial deliveries have gone up um, significantly over the past few years, particularly during COVID. Um, and so we designated a one square mile of our downtown corridor um, in that image on the left, which has the highest density of businesses, restaurants, shops, um, where there are a lot of deliveries. And so we created loading zones specifically for zero emission delivery vehicles with the goal of incentivizing commercial fleets to switch to um, electric delivery vehicles. So we've partnered with Ikea and Guayaquil, the Yerba Mate company and a local linen delivery company, um, and then also there's this company called Coco that has electric robots that do food delivery, um, which is this image over here. And so there are a lot of partnerships involved, um, but this is just a quick overview of um, what we're doing in terms of creating priority uh, loading spots specifically for zero emission vehicles. Um, and these curb spaces are tracked by cam video cameras that are mounted and can um, track the number of parks they can, they can um, through their AI, they can tell whether or not it's a zero emission vehicle through the make and model. Um, and then we also have a logo, which is that blue logo in the image. That sticker is on the vehicles that are actually partners of the pilot program, but any zero emission vehicle that's making a delivery. Um, so even if that's an Uber Eats or Postmates drop off or um, whatever it may be, as long as they're zero emission, they're authorized to be in that parking space for up to the 10 minute period. So um, the pilot goes through the end of this year and we're still working on trying to get a, a major delivery company on board, um, but it's been really interesting to see kind of um, the ins and outs of what, what this process is gonna look like if we deploy on a much larger scale. So the idea is that we can create some sort of blueprint for other cities to replicate. Um, we're also part of a much larger project funded by the Department of US Department of Energy, um, where we're expanding this concept to the cities of LA and the cities of Pittsburgh. Um, so it's gonna be a multi-year grant period. Um, so we can certainly share more once we have more information, but I, I'm assuming I went over two minutes, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
No, you did great, Ariana. And um, I would like actually to hear from other delegates and attendees. Are there any questions about um, what Ariana just presented? I think especially um, the delivery zone is something that we have heard a lot um, from our cities that they are really trying to create these. And I think you're ahead, Ariana. So we'll probably reach out for more information regarding those. Sure, happy to, happy to share anything we can. Thank you. And now we're gonna move to Madrid, where they are also implementing different measures. Thank you so much, Pedro, for joining us today. And the floor is yours. Hi, how are you doing? I think, um, Susana, uh, you're moving forward the uh, picture, right? Yes, yes. Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, it was really interesting to know that information from Zaragoza, or as we say here, Zaragoza, Everybody loves that city <laughs> and everybody knows about the tram and it was kind of uh, the best example for us. Uh, we don't have a tram like they have in Zaragoza because they were all removed in the 70s. But uh, we're um, almost there with the light uh, railway systems, but also as you can see in the picture with the new um, electric buses, which is the kind of the biggest fleet we have in Spain about electrical buses. Now we, what we have in the in the picture is the Atocha railway station, which is the biggest railway station in Spain and probably in Southern Europe, as we have most of the direct links with other cities, like for instance, Zaragoza, Barcelona, which is the same railway. So what uh, was made to, it would be three years ago, my God, if time flies. Uh, was uh, to have these new electrical uh, lines, which are double zero, which, that means uh, it's uh, zero cost, zero euros, and it's also zero emissions. So this means that we have lots of people coming to Atocha and attending meetings or going for dinner or attending theaters in the city center. So with this, we avoided uh, people who were using private cars or kind of uh, complaining about the price of uh, the public transportation system. This is really easy to use and it can move you forward through all the central district of Madrid, which is uh, a good example of what was made in order to avoid not even private cars, but also congestion with taxis and Uber, Cabify, which is really very used as much as in the US. But that was the problem that uh, having so many cars in the central district was uh, chaotic, so chaotic. So with this line, you're perfectly linked with the, another uh, exchange uh, point, which is Moncloa, where you can also meet uh, two lines of metro. So it's kind of easy, it's kind of working. Uh, the only thing is that uh, there are still people that are obviously not uh, willing to use the public transportation that uh, this is a way to to connect um, i mean sustainable uh, uses of uh, public transport and no more complaints about if it's expensive or not okay thank you susanna if <clears throat> where we can have a look here is uh, we are planning with what we call bus bow that means uh, high occupation lanes and bus lanes this is the, oh, it's funny for, for you because this is uh, the highway from Madrid to Zaragoza, Barcelona. So again, we're linking to Zaragoza. And as you can see, we have these green buses and they are linking Madrid to other cities like the city of uh, Cervantes, which is Alcalá de Henares. The problem here is that uh, these uh, green buses are running out of outside of the city. And this highway, of course, is one of the most congestion, congested uh, highways into Madrid. So what we are planning is to use these uh, lanes for certain hours in, into Madrid and outbound uh, for private uh, companies, for buses, but also the public uh, transportation system, mass transportation system. And it's going to be controlled by people in real time. That means that uh, any time that we need the lane for another uses, or kind of other vehicles like green vehicles or electric vehicles, it can also be used. And it will all display in these kind of uh, new panels that are gonna be implemented. 
So we are going to see how this will be working. And if it works, we will implement it in other um, highways coming into Madrid. We will see how it works. The only thing that the worries us is, as you can see on the right side of the picture, we have a stop for a local bus. And you can see it's using another lane. Mm, the thing is that some people are will be willing that the local buses will be using this uh, fast lane. But uh, we will have to explain that this fast lane is for more in regional kind of traffic. So this is kind of uh, not only what we do, what we have to explain to people. Thank you, Susanna. If... And another thing that we have is the what we call Bifimad, according to Bike Madrid, and the bike parking at the stations that we are trying to implement. As you saw the first picture, it was the green double zero line from Atocha, the railway station, to Moncloa, which is this exchange point with the more buses, green buses, and the two metro lines. This is what we have in the image. And uh, as you know, it, it is not easy to implement this uh, working for bikes because you know, we're a Mediterranean country and some people feel like uh, security is not the best that we will have uh, like in Norway, Sweden, Denmark. So that means we should be starting to plan these uh, bike parks inside the buildings, which are, they have private security. They are so easy to be watched by CCTV. And the thing is that it's still not uh, working that much. And the thing is that uh, we have this public system, but uh, it occupies a lot of uh, place. So this is one of the aims that we want to work on it in the next years so that uh, we can use these spaces for the public bike transportation system, but also for private people. Mm, the thing is that people trust uh, more to leave a bike inside the building, but they also want to take it uh, home or take it to the office where they work into charge. So it's going to be, we're going to make some different uh, strategies to see what people will need if they need to charge the bike, if we have to, they have to pay for them. So that is uh, what is going to be implemented because we have all these uh, intercambiadores, which are the change transport change points. But most people who are right there are not using the bike. They are usually walking home or walking from uh, the office to these points. So we want to reach people more farther than 500 meters up to one kilometer, uh, even one mile that would be using, these people would be using a bike to reach these areas that would make uh, their transportation faster and uh, it would encourage using of a public transportation system. So uh, thank you for this. Uh, I don't know if there are questions or more things like that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pedro. Are there any questions for Pedro? Okay, not for now, but I'm sure um, they will have, especially because it is not that usual to have a public transport that is free. <laughs> and I know that probably a lot of people are wondering how is it that um, you're funding that, and especially if it's a zero emissions transport. Well, that's a good question because these lines, we have two lines and uh, the double zero one is uh, working because uh, it's linking the main railway station and the city center. It was used uh, very popular also for tourists because they learned uh, that it is cheap, or not cheap, but it's for free. So people were using, but uh, during the pandemic time, of course, the use of this uh, was uh, falling only with uh, local people. But uh, we are hoping that it, this number is incre increasing. Like the first year they were implemented in 2019. So, uh, I mean, when we see the more tourists we're getting into the city center, we'll see this again, the same use. But uh, I need to tell you that we have uh, more than 240 local lines of uh, public buses and these are only two lines. Of course, they are a link in the city center, the most popular areas for pedestrian people, touristic places. And one of the things that we were seeing is that uh, tourists, um, 
they don't usually expect to learn how to get a ticket if they can pay with the, even if they can pay with the credit card directly um, just uh, with NFC technology. We see that there, there is like a certain resistance to use these uh, buses, but if they see that it is free, it is electrical, and with this use, they are not using a car instead, it was uh, working. And even local people that were waiting for another line doing the same project, even if they have the monthly uh, pass, they were also using this line because they, they, are, they have a good frequency. So everybody was happy with that. You know, when something is free, no one complains. And the thing is zero emissions, it was working and they have a special different color as the rest of the lines. So we will see. Thank you okay. so much, Pedro. Sounds very, very good. And I really appreciate um, Santa Monica and Madrid explaining um, all of these different modes that they are implementing. But I think that one of the biggest challenges is, as you said, Pedro, right now it's in a small area where you're having these line. But how are we expanding our networks of these um, new systems that we're implementing? And we're going to hear about this challenge from Metropolis GZM from Eva. Uh, yes, uh, hi. Uh, so shortly about uh, our situation. So uh, it is, I focus on just the challenge, so a problem. Uh, if you could just show the um, picture. So uh, basically it's an example of the situation that refers to the whole region. Because for the past four decades, the public transport in the metropolis, the network has remained barely unchanged. So, you know, it's still serving old post-industrial areas, which are barely or not functioning anymore. And it's, I'd say, ignoring new developments. So this example that is on the map, it shows uh, like um, neighborhoods or uh, re 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 like um, some states of the city and a huge economic zone. So the, in the center of the picture, you can see like mm, pink dotted line, which is an overpass that was open in uh, 2012, so 10 years ago. And it made it so much easier to actually get uh, to the economic zone, but it took 10 years for the authorities to put a bus route on that overpass. So it's an example of, you know, like having the road infrastructure, but not using it to um, adjust the transportation uh, like system so that we actually, instead of um, convincing people to use public transport transportation more often, we would rather uh, encourage them to buy their cars because the public transportation isn't efficient. So it took 10 years to actually start the bus route. It started exactly 10 days ago. So it's a very new thing and as you can see like in the in the information in the top of the picture the yellow line that has just started it uh, it's uh, it takes three times less than the blue line that has been there for a decade or more so the challenge is because we're a, we're a post-industrial picture uh, we're a post industrial um region we have more uh, areas like that i mean we used to have the coal mines and the plants uh, and so on. And I'll uh, share my screen for a little while just to show you, or I can't do it, but I'll, I'll show you, I'll send you the link. You can, oh, you can, you can, for you, can you can. Give me you one can, second. Can, okay. yeah. Yes. All right. I think uh, you should be able to do it now. Okay, yes, yes. So okay. I'll just show you the screen for a little while. Can you see it? Not yet. It's just, yeah, we see it now. Perfect. Okay, great. So this is the, the area of our metropolis, like a lot of cities. And I wanted to depict um, one thing, like the um, purple um, purple areas are the post-industrial areas. So they are vacant or barely used at the moment. And the colorful dots are the new developments. So new logistics center or trade or production areas. And it's very, sadly, it's quite often that we have the road infrastructure there, but we don't keep up with the public transportation. And I, I think it's really, it's a challenge for us because the uh, motorization rate is rising very, very fast. We have a lot of cars and we don't keep up with the infrastructure with, you know, giving them people new routes in order to, um, to offer them 
transportation to work. So it is a challenge, you know, we're, uh, yeah, I, I just want to show that. So I think it is, I didn't put the bus lanes on the picture because it's a huge area. There's a lot of bus lanes and I would kind of uh, be a mess in the picture, but I hope you, you get the idea of what I mean. Uh, so yeah, that's generally the problem. And what we're trying to do now, we've, uh, we've started to create the uh, sustainable urban uh, dev uh, mobility plan, hoping that, um, that that would help us, but we want to make a revolution <laughs> that lies in um, just relying on the rails and developing rails a lot. But, but you know, it's like the, the challenge is that once you lose the passengers, that once they see that it's much faster, much more convenient with the car, it's not that easy to actually regain them afterwards. So that is a challenge that we're facing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eva. And I'm actually going to ask our attendees if anyone has implemented a solution to, to increase these. And I think that this was also a question that we heard from Robert Lazaro, if there had been an effect during the pandemic in reducing um, the ridership, decreasing the ridership in your city. And we will hear um, uh, from Umea about these, but I want to ask right now our cities, the ones who are attending this session, what have you done in your city to increase ridership? Okay, no answer so far, but we will definitely leave this question open, Eva. And as we are hearing from initiatives in other cities within our network, we will be happy to share them with you. I think it's really exciting that you're telling us that this project has just launched, especially because as you know, our program will last for the next, well, this year and the following one. And I'm really eager to know by the end of 2023, what's happening um, with your new bus lanes with your bus system. I hope to be success a little, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Eva. And now, David, if we can go back to the presentation. Perfect. And now we're moving with Ottawa with Jennifer Armstrong. As we heard um, from GZM, there is a challenge about expanding the network, but also one of the biggest questions is how do we fund that expansion? Jennifer. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, you could uh, head to the the next slide. Um, so I just have one slide. Uh, I'll try to keep it within the two minutes. Um, this is speaking to the challenge. Um, the, the image on the bottom is uh, from our uh, most recent transportation master plan, and it shows the transit network that we would need uh, to achieve our mode share targets and to reach our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, the red lines are light rail, uh, the dark blue lines are dedicated um, transit ways in their own right of way. Um, the city has had a very successful transitway system since about the 80s, and uh, there's the, the red lines are, are essentially converting that existing transitway to a, to a light rail service. Uh, so you can see, you know, there's lots of lines, and then the, the paler um, light blue lines there are transit priorities, so things like uh, continuous bus lanes, uh, queue jump lanes, uh, signal timing, those sorts of things. Um, that's what we need. What we can afford when we did the affordability analysis is the image on the top. And you can see that uh, uh, it's certainly a lot uh, less of an expensive network there. Um, we have been successful in uh, getting some financial support from upper levels of government, um, but clearly um, there's a pretty big gap. And that's just on the infrastructure side, that doesn't take into account things like how do we improve the, the pedestrian and cycling connections to transit? How do we increase the frequency of transit service and make sure that we're providing a high frequency of service, not just in our peak periods, uh, but throughout the day, which is things that we've also heard from our community. So um, I think from, from our perspective, and, and I don't work, um, I'm in the transportation planning group, not the, the transit planning group, so I'm sure they would also have some additional challenges to speak to, but from 
from our perspective, you know, just the funding and being able to to implement what we have identified as the need is really the challenge that that we're dealing with. And and certainly there's lots of options, but um, you know, what is going to be acceptable um, to the public in terms of funding and uh, politically acceptable. Um, there's all sorts of issues, and so uh, you know, how do we go about um, raising the the funds that we need to to implement um, what we've identified? Thank you, Jennifer. This slide has so much strength, um, and I know it's just two maps, but it exemplifies how much we know already what we need to do to have a successful transport and mobility in our cities. But at the same time, you cannot do it because there is so much lack of funding in this area. And I wonder what Miguel Angel thinks because it seemed um, when Trisha asked about funding, it, you have it um, solved already. And I wonder how that um, evolved throughout time. And I know you mentioned you're getting funding from the European Union, but at the same time that your system has become uh, sustainable, especially the buses. I don't know if you want to talk more about that, Miguel Angel. I'm um, not sure Miguel Angel answered, but I open um, to anyone, any of our cities here, how are you obtaining funding to expand your, your networks? Uh, so, sorry, Susana, I had some <laughs> problems with the, with the sound. Can no you worries, repeat the Miguel question, Angel. please? Yes, of course. Um, I was asking, because the challenge for Ottawa is that they have identified really what their ideal network looked like, which is the, the bottom image. But actually the one that they can fund is the one um, on top. And we really wonder how Saragossa has made that possible. And you talked about your transport being already economically sustainable, um, not the Trump, but the new plans. And beyond getting funding from the European Union, I would like to know if you have any other insights regarding um, making this economically viable. Well, the question is to arrive uh, to a balance between the number of users and the cost that you have on the, on the network. And um, uh, since the uh, economical uh, situation of electrical buses are using uh, significantly less energy than uh, fuel uh, buses, <clears throat> it can reduce the operational costs. And then we can maintain low uh, fares. So with these low fares, people is uh, using uh, uh, in very high rates the buses. So uh, finally, uh, the using of uh, the buses is very high. Uh, really, uh, it's one of the highest in, uh, in volume in Spain uh, in relation of uh, uses per kilometer. And this is why we can reach this uh, economical balance. Anyway, as this is a public service, we need to uh, uh, sustain economically because a lot of people is not paying. Um, people uh, under uh, youngs under eight are not paying, are free. Uh, age people uh, that are uh, retired are free. So uh, finally, we need to uh, arrive uh, to, a, to a balance. But uh, this, this situation should be sustainable for, from uh, the, the point of view of the budget of the, of the municipality. And uh, uh, really, this, this, uh, uh, the money we, uh, we support for the, the public transport is uh, an investment for the city uh, because we, we have uh, less uh, uh, invaded uh, streets by cars, we need, uh, we have a, a, a very reduced number of cars within the streets. So uh, it's a most uh, 
amical city, a friendly city, than uh, uh, one city with a less uh, comfortable and less attractive public transport. So we need to invest it because the, the finally it's worthy for the citizens. Thank you so much, Miguel Angel. But this, I... but this is a question, it's a question uh, of a balance between uses, number of uses, and uh, obtaining the less operation costs as possible. Exactly. And I think that I was going to actually highlight that, that I keep hearing from everyone about ridership and increasing ridership. And we have seen because of the pandemic actually a decrease and that's so worrying. And I see, for example, that Claudia from uh, San Diego is mentioning how in San Diego they're about to launch these um, new new program in which kids ages 18 and under will ride for free in the hope that this will attract more passengers to public transport. And now we move on to Umea, who actually has a pilot to increase also ridership. Philip. Yes, thank you very much. So now moving up to northern part of Sweden, I don't think I have any slides. <laughs> it was just two minutes. So I hope it will be OK. And, and I mean, for us, um, um, this is just one example of how we can really emphasize uh, that you have to test all different types of systematic uh, kind of sustainable travel systems in your city. So we have done a, a pilot here with uh, families uh, and targeting really the car free lifestyle um, and really put an emphasis on families with uh, kids that are quite complex uh, transport uh, needs uh, in everyday life. And also how can we emphasize sustainable lifestyles in that, um, in that way. So what we did was that we really offered the families uh, in our pilot groups a kind of access to uh, public transport, uh, sharing of cargo bikes, carpooling, and, and electric bikes in their life. In, in return, they kind of park the car for, for a couple of months. And, and we have in that um, interviews on, during this experience. And um, uh, as uh, just to mention a few, I mean, um, uh, three months is enough to change your lifestyle. And uh, you have to be aware that you need to overcome some thresholds. And one thing I find really interesting from our project was that uh, the social norms about having a car and, and how do you, as a family, kind of have to put into that, like you have to take your kids to school or sports activities, etc. that is really as a norm in your society that you had to speak about and to kind of solving in our society here as anyway. And also about gender equality, we see that we have different travel patterns depending on men and women and how you um, like has to access travel to work or to schools and, and etc. So I think this is quite interesting to really think about and evaluate. I mean, what is the transport system uh, for and how can we put it together to to fit together these different types of uh, travels in the in the city. So um, for us, uh, this um, kind of testing all system at once with the, the families has been a great input for the city hall to really try to understand how bike lanes, the public transport and other ways of travels really needs to to piece together in different uh, neighborhoods. Um, so that's yes, something I would stress when uh, talking about um, kind of sustainable uh, mobility in your cities. So I think um, this might be a bit broader angle than, than the transport uh, system we have been talking about, but equally important and, and to really understand who is traveling and for what reason and how can we build that uh, in the everyday life. So uh, if there's some discussion about that, I would love to connect with other cities that is also working with uh, like piecing this kind of system together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Philip. And um, I know you in this program, you were actually offering incentives for these families to travel um, in public transport. How long was that? It was for the three full months. Were there any conditions? Uh, yes, yeah, so so we did the, the project was uh, launched for three months in the autumn and uh, in the northern part of uh, Europe it's quite a harsh time with weather conditions, uh, so it was quite uh, not just in the beautiful summer days um, up here 
but the condition was that you can't use your car uh, for those months. So we were kind of following that. And uh, I think uh, many came back and said it was easier than they thought when they are starting out and trying this lifestyle that they were implementing and uh, and they changed like the way of thinking and i think also it was quite interesting that uh, they consume less other products as well they mm. were less stressed about the consumption because they had to plan it uh, ahead <laughs> much more and uh, and the cargo bikes the electric cargo bikes that we provided was equally important that you really can uh, take your ski- kids to school in a in a cargo bike instead of your car going to work for example and then going to the public transport system from the outskirts of the city neighborhoods but the, the condition was no um, no use of car and to be to be uh, interviewed and and the researcher from the university that we that kind of followed this project and did the research about it um, that they had to be access to that uh, yeah so and and in the end of the project many families uh, sold their cars and, and this is one of them and the reduction of that and i think it's the most important that we see a reduction of co2 emissions and in umeo 50 percent of co2 emission is from transport so this is a really high uh, importance for us Absolutely. Very interesting pilot, Philip. And if you would be able to share with us more information, perhaps a link as Ariana from Santa Monica is requesting, we would appreciate it so that we can share these with many of our cities in the network. Yeah, for sure. We have some summaries in English and then, uh, yeah, we can provide more information uh, in the discussions. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we move um, to some of the things that are actually disrupting our actions. So we may have a great network, we may have ridership, but there are other things like the battle for curb utilization that cities are facing. So um, the floor is yours, Claudia. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, So the question, that I have is, you know, trying to balance the, the curb needs throughout the day, particularly in our business districts. Um, in my line of work, I'm constantly meeting with business owners and cycling advocates and um, people with disabilities and delivery drivers, and everybody's pleading their case for, for having a um, curb space. Um, right now, because of the pandemic, a lot of um, our uh, restaurants have also moved outdoors, and so they've essentially taken over what would be the parking right in front of their business. And so just, it's like a constant battle of trying to, uh, you know, mitigate or make sure that everybody has a place along the curb. And so I was just wondering um, if me, uh, the other cities have um, some kind of remedy or, or other um, or other plans um, for either monetizing the curb space or how to better utilize the curb space. Thank you, Claudia. And from the cities joining us today, how are you? How are you managing your curb? Uh, this is Drew Brooks from uh, Fort Collins. Um, yeah, this has been a really difficult thing for us because um, during the pandemic, and we've continued it since then. We've been using a lot of our curb space and parking spaces spaces for um, outdoor dining. And um, our, our customers and our, our residents have really enjoyed that. And it's something that is really changing the way that we look at curb management. I can't say that we've figured out uh, the, all the right methodology there, but I think it's going to change the, the game going forward for us because our residents want to see that space used for something different. Um, not all, but most seem to want to see that space used for something different. So. Curb management is is at the top of our mind and it's something that we're going to be working on very closely over the the next few years. So if anyone has great ideas, we'd love to hear them as well. Andrew, I also know um, that you had a challenge, which I didn't include in the presentation, but you can share as well if you like. Yeah, one of our challenges, and I don't know if this is an international challenge, but is really um, having enough bus operators to operate buses um, is one of our biggest problems. We're we're currently seeing a shortage in operators of about 20% 
Um, and it's something that we're seeing across the entire country, not just in the state of Colorado here. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is we've been, we've been raising pay and, and trying to adjust for a variety of different um, you know, incentives, um, but it is, it is a real problem. Um, what we found in talking to our operators is that, that um, here in the States that um, pay is not the only issue, it's the, just the nature of the job has changed dramatically um, with things like enforcing uh, mask use wearing and things like that has be, made the job much more um, contentious than it was in the past. And so we've been working on, on kind of those type of factors as well, but we'd love to hear any ideas that, that folks have around um, ways to uh, hire and retain really good bus operators and, and transit workers. Thanks so much, Drew. And actually, yes, when we um, asked other cities to, to explain what their biggest challenge was, we heard from several of them talking about the same issues. So yes, I, I would really like to hear from cities here. Um, what uh, are you facing the same one? And I know uh, Robert Lazaro from Northern Virginia Regional Commission just said they are. If you have found a solution or if you're facing the same challenge, please share it with us now. G Z M as well, so different country. Yeah, definitely. We've, we've had that uh, for the past months. We've had some problems with uh, drivers. Also, it uh, in terms of uh, salaries. That's the one thing, and the other thing is COVID quarantine. With the forced wave, it was let's say say we really had to cancel or limit some um, like bus routes in January, because it was it was really hectic, I'd say. Thank you so much, Eva. And um, I am noticing, thank you so much to all of the cities that are sharing links um, in the chat. We are seeing now some um, insights about pilots related to curb utilization. And of course, if you have any other thoughts about how to bring more personnel, how to deal with COVID um, in terms of the teams, um, the drivers of the buses and public transport getting sick, we would love to hear about that as well so that we can share um, with our city's network. Oh, San Diego as well. Interesting. And of course, um, New York City, where I'm based, um, we are suffering from the same, which is affecting a lot our subway system. So before um, we close, since this is the very first session that we are having around sustainable uh, transport and mobility, we wanted to finalize, but just asking you if you want to say it out loud, or if you want to include it in the chat, what would be the main topics that you would like us to discuss during our upcoming sessions? I'm hearing about funding. I'm hearing um, also, it was interesting that I heard from, and I know because I worked with Santa Monica, but also from Pedro from Madrid, how tourism and transport intersect and how um, these might be a challenge, but also how they are solving it also in, in Santa Monica with free transport. Um, we can also talk about free fares and other ideas. So free feel, feel free to add it in the chat or to send it an email. You will see now in this last slide, our contact information for David, our team leader, um, Trisha Hackett, our senior sustainable urban development expert and myself. You can email any of us and we will either get you in touch with other cities or if you have any challenges you're facing, we can also just keep that in mind. So if we hear from any initiatives in the city that might be helpful to you, we will be happy to share it. Any last um, thoughts from anyone? Miguel Angel, thank you so much for um, your presentation today. It was really insightful. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you for all of the attendees and for being so open um, to share information in the chat and um, out loud. We will be sending you a survey later this week. 
where you will um, be asked um, to obviously um, say what you thought about the session today, but most importantly, to actually mention if there are any of the initiatives and programs that you heard from today, if you would like to learn more so that we can create those uh, connections between yourself and the other cities and delegates. Thank you, I don't know, David, do you wanna say something as our team leader? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Susana, and I invite everybody to come to Zaragoza to show improvements uh, by your uh, own eyes and uh, enjoy the city and uh, the beauty we have and the wonders uh, we have here uh, in our town that uh, David knows uh, it very well. Well. <laughs> well, now that you open this, uh, yeah, I got to confess to everyone here, honestly, no bias, no nothing, but uh, I am from Zaragoza. I'm based in Ottawa, of all places. I coordinate the program for North America, and now that uh, Miguel Angel revealed it, then yeah, I'm from Zaragoza, and uh, you got to come along. We're, uh, we'd be very possibly, we're hoping to organize um, an in-person event. Uh, I think you mentioned this before, Susan, and now some, obviously many of our cities know an in-person event for networking um, in this field of uh, mobility uh, in Zaragoza, very possibly this autumn, but there'll be more news to come around that. And uh, it'd be great to have you all there. It'd be a great excuse for me to, be, to go back home after all these years. And it is a wonderful place. Don't miss it. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Miguel Angel, for sharing it. But to all the, all the other cities, I mean, I was, uh, there's so much there. We'll be sharing it very soon. We'll try to extract the best bits and, and make, make them available to you and keep this forum open, okay? So thank you, Susana. Go to you. Yeah. Thanks, David. And that was great that you mentioned the event because this way, also in the survey, we will include a question about having you join the event if you're interested in coming during the autumn to Zaragoza and looking at all of these incredible technology and solutions by in real life um, and actually riding the buses. <laughs> we invite you um, in the fall and let us know if you would like to come. Thank you everyone and have a great day or afternoon. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Susana. Good job. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.